another very recent patient, 37-year-old female. Um, she had mitral valve prolapse with severe mitral regurgitation and in 2000 had mitral valve repair. Her aortic root at that time was 40 millimeters and nothing was done to it. Um, she had attended, she had her mitral repair at Mayo Clinic and then we saw her in 2005 and at that time her aortic root was 44 millimeters. And then she elected to be followed elsewhere. Um, was followed locally, had two uneventful pregnancies. We can talk a little bit more about that. And then gradual of aortic root dilatation. And she's referred back asymptomatic. And here are her features. Obviously, this is not her, but I'm just showing you some of her facial features. So blood pressure, saturation, you can see her BMI is only 21. She's 180 centimeters and 69 kilos. And she had skin stria, which are similar to, this is not the patient, but very similar to this, over the shoulders, uh, both shoulders. She also had dolicocephaly, which is demonstrated in this individual. So long, narrow face and down slanting palpebral fissures. She had a systolic click and a murmur. And then she also had what we call the thumb sign, which is demonstrated here, where the distal phalanx of the thumb protrudes over the um, the hand when it's uh, folded over, and also um, the positive wrist sign. And here, the patient has to overlap the distal phalanx of the um, little finger, and demonstrates arachnodactyly. So she had really quite striking features. She also had aortic root dilatation. So I'm going to ask you, what is the diagnosis in this patient? Is it bicuspid valve-related aortopathy? Marfan syndrome with related aortopathy, vasculitis, degenerative aortopathy, or can you not tell? Excellent. Yeah. So the patient meets clinical criteria from what I've shown you for Marfan syndrome. This is not a trick. So here's her electrocardiogram, chest x-ray, and it's, this is pretty typical also, very sort of tall person, hyper-expanded hyper lungs, um, and narrow pedicle. She did not have pectus, you can see there from her sternal wires. And let's look at her echocardiogram. So of course, we're looking at the aortic root, which is dilated, and I'll show you the measurement in just a moment. I think additional imaging tips here are that we can see the descending thoracic aorta, not just in the short axis view, but also in the long axis view. Look at that. We can see a beautiful example in that off-axis apical view of the descending thoracic aorta. So use all that information that you get by echocardiography. Not that we wouldn't do cross-sectional imaging, but obviously we get a lot of information. So again, remember she had mitral valve repair, so we want to look at that also closely. Her aortic root in this a little bit skewed measurement was measured at 49 millimeters. And then aortic valve regurgitation. And then obviously we want to look at the mitral closely. It looks, what do you think? Soren, good, bad? Pretty good, I'd say. Looks great, absolutely. So a fantastic repair done in 2000. And this echo was done uh, within the last two weeks. No significant aortic valve gradient. Um, the peak velocity there was just over one. And then there is a little aortic valve regurgitation. And then, of course, we want to look at the mitral valve here. And there was no significant mitral inflow obstruction. And just trivial uh, mitral valve regurgitation. And then also her abdominal aortic uh, pulse wave Doppler was normal. OK, what do you suggest? Observation and follow-up. See again in a year. Surgical intervention. CT or MR, genetic consultation and testing, or other. <laughs>
So most common was number three, CT or MR. I think um, that's a common observation and follow-up in one year was the next um, uh, most common. Um, nobody chose other, so I won't ask what you do. So here's her CTA. I think very important, again, to confirm the measurement that we get by echo with a cross-sectional imaging study if that hasn't been done recently. And we can see here a very nice example of really marked root dilatation with fairly preserved ascending aortic dimension. The ascending aorta measured fairly normal. And then, Nandan, do you want to just review what you're measuring here? So sinus to sinus, et cetera? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the first important thing is that um, we have to be transaxial to the um, uh, uh, blood flow. We have to be perpendicular to the blood flow. And that we can do very easily on CT scan. Um, once we get perpendicular to the uh, blood flow, then we have that level. And then we do the largest we can get sinus to sinus. Um, and that's what we re report, and we try to be, and the reason why we do that is because that's how we report an echo as well. Okay. And so the dimension here measured, um, you do outer edge to outer edge? Yeah, no, we sort of try to do um, inner, uh, sort of, we look at the blood sort of contour, so inner edge to inner edge. Um, the wall thickness is um, so well defined on CT, so it, it makes it a lot easier to do that. Um, as opposed to echo, where we use, I think, the leading edge, leading edge, um, or, or we have to define the edge before we measure. Okay. And so you can see nicely demonstrated here, and a number of different planes were measured, and the largest dimension was 51 millimeters. Anything else? Can we make a diagnosis and a recommendation based on that? So another imaging tip is to look at all the images yourself. And here, this patient has lumbosacral duralectasia seen on her CT and had actually been demonstrated on prior cross-sectional imaging. So anybody seen that before, know what that means? Consistent with a diagnosis of Marfan syndrome. It's not just seen in Marfan syndrome, but it really increases that likelihood significantly. So goes along with uh, what, we, what we thought on her physical exam. And then I didn't tell you anything about her family history, but she has two children, had two uneventful pregnancies, as I mentioned. Her son has had genetic testing and is FBN1 positive, so he carries the diagnosis of Marfan syndrome also. And interestingly, daughter was screened with an echocardiogram, and she was found to have a bicuspid aortic valve. So what do you suggest now? Observation and follow-up in a year, valve sparing root and ascending aorta replacement, composite valve and ascending aorta replacement, or something else. Observation and follow-up in a year. Okay. Panel? I would be a little uncomfortable observing. Um, if, if I was to observe, I, I probably wouldn't, I would do it maybe within three months or so because we don't have any idea of the rate of growth. And it's in my fans, um, she's at a high risk of dissection where she is already. Yeah. Yeah. Other comments, Nish? Soren? No, just the same. I, I think I think maybe surgery rather than not surgery. The the valve repair versus valve replacement. That's something that uh, that I'm uh, constantly um, um, surprised by what can and cannot be repaired. And in the end, it's a surgeon who's going to inspect the valve, who's going to make that decision. And so she went to the operating room last week, actually, and here are images from her echocardiogram. Was there anything unusual about her transthoracic echo? Anybody notice? You, can you show the short axis of her aortic valve again? <laughs> I noticed Buzz <laughs> noticed it. But I think we get so focused on a particular diagnosis that sometimes we don't see something that's so obvious. Yeah. And you'll see Actually, actually even on the long axis, she had doming as she, a, who yeah, was a clue. She did, yep. Mm -hmm. So she meet, clearly meets criteria for Marfan syndrome. She's the first person in her family, and her son has an FBN1 uh, gene mutation, so there's no question that she has Marfan syndrome. But as Buzz alluded to, her aortic valve is not normal. And so here it is. She has fusion of the um, right and left cusps here, so partial fusion, and she had a functional bicuspid aortic valve as well. And so 
that systolic doming and then also um, aortic valve regurgitation related to that. And remember what I said with the last patient, that the presence of the bicuspid aortic valve doesn't exclude an alternate diagnosis. So she had two things, two strikes against her, um, and she went to surgical intervention. The plan was to spare the valve, but that was not feasible. Even done by one of our um, very experienced aortic surgeons, Dr. Alberto Pucatino, that was his intent, but he said that the valve was very friable and he was not able to spare the aortic valve. And so I'll show you the operation that she had done um, uh, in, in just a second. So. Remember that in Marfan syndrome, although any part of the aorta can be dilated, the classic features are dilatation of the aortic root. And so if you see root dilatation, that should always be on the differential. And nicely demonstrated in this patient CT was that really striking root dilatation with a fairly preserved ascending aorta. There was a question about medication, and this is the patient population. The Marfan patient population are those, in, uh, those patients in whom we have data to support medical therapy. Um, and uh, this was reported in 2014. Um, it was a randomized study looking at young individuals with proven Marfan syndrome comparing losartan to atenolol. And both medications actually decreased the rate at which the aorta enlarged. And more recent data suggests that combining them might actually be beneficial. In my practice, I generally start with one. I usually start a beta blocker um, as the first choice and then, and then sometimes change to losartan if the patients can't tolerate it. And I use two, of course, for hypertension and or for aggressive uh, aortic disease. And then I think there was hesitancy to make a recommendation to intervene on this patient's. This patient is young. She needs aortic surgery. Her aorta has increased by 10 millimeters uh, over um, uh, 20 years, but certainly it has increased in size. And waiting is not going to be beneficial for her. So we would recommend intervention for any patients with Marfan syndrome who have an aorta of five centimeters or more, and then decrease that intervention with any high-risk features. And again, those include personal or family history of aortic dissection, rapid enlargement of the aorta, and that's defined as five millimeter increase in a year, or planned pregnancy. And I have information in your handout about pregnancy, but I think in the interest of time, I won't discuss that today. So again, this is what our patient had, aortic root dilatation, nicely demonstrated here in the schematic. And the operations that that our surgeon, um, aortic surgeon Alberto Pocatino does is either valve sparing, so the native valve is preserved, but remember that the whole root has to be replaced, and then the coronaries need to be reimplanted. So aortic valve sparing, root replacement, and he actually also does a hemi arch on these patients who have genetically triggered aortic disease because he recognizes that the highest likelihood of reintervention is progression of aortic disease beyond that graft. And then this is the Bentel procedure or the composite valve and ascending aortic graft. I think an important imaging point for the individuals who are doing the images on these patients post-op is that remember that these patients have a composite. It's one piece. There's no opportunity for perivalvular regurgitation. So whenever I see a, an echo report that says there's no perivalvular regurgitation, I say, well, that's really a great relief. So the other imaging point is that there is a little bit of aorta that's left behind here when the coronaries are sutured in. And this is an area where aneurysms can form. So coronary button aneurysms are uh, one of the problems that can arise in these patients and can be seen in echo, but another reason to do multimodality imaging even in the post-operative period. So a comprehensive care team is a buzzword for everything we do these days, and the aortic team is also an important uh, group. Um, I think just in the interest of time, we won't talk about some of the exercise uh, things, but maybe, well, I'll just say, we advise against heavy isometric exercise, but actually there's new data that suggests that regular um, exercise may be beneficial for patients who have aortic disease. Um, and that's based on animal studies, the mouse model of Marfan syndrome. 
So pregnancy in patients with Marfan syndrome, um, the high risk features, personal or family history of aortic dissection, rapid enlargement, or an aortic dimension that exceeds the threshold, and the threshold that we would generally advise against pregnancy is outlined in this table. And I'm happy to discuss that in more detail um, uh, with anybody who has specific questions, but it's in your handout. So what about follow-up? As I alluded to in the first patient, I'm gonna to continue to follow that patient. I'll see him back in six months with repeat imaging, and then it would be annually after that. So he's unoperated, and then, of course, until he meets the threshold for intervention. In the operated patient, it's individualized. This patient just had surgery last week, and we would want her seen again. She'll have predismissal echocardiogram and CT scans, so that's a new fingerprint for her. And then we would want to see her in about six months, and then she would have cross and echo at least once a year for the first three years after surgical intervention. And again, remember, the areas of concern are the part um, adjacent to the aortic graft and then the coronary button aneurysms. So my approach to patients who have aortopathy, the take-home points is make a diagnosis. Careful personal history, family history, and physical exam, and you can make the diagnosis in many, but not all patients. Multimodality imaging is absolutely critical in this patient population. And then, as I alluded to, genetics, we're doing more and more and more in these patients. And I did offer it to our patient, but she said, I meet criteria, my son has it, and I know I've got it as well. So making that diagnosis helps us to come up with a detailed management plan. Um, and then, as I alluded to, medical therapy, when appropriate, in specific diagnosis, and then regular imaging. And then, of course, we want to make recommendations about lifestyle and multidisciplinary care. And then intervention really depends, again, on the diagnosis. Um, should be done at an experience center. These are patients that are challenging to care for, um, and you want a surgeon who does it every day or every week. And uh, we have a great aortic team at our uh, center. And then, obviously, these patients do require lifelong follow-up. 